Sex and the City pushed the envelope. Who wants the wiener? I thought no one has ever typed this. And we just had no idea what the reaction would be. Then ripped it to shreds. There was a guy who liked to watch pornography while we were having sex. There was a guy who liked to be spanked. We decided, Sarah, Jessica, and I, that when they were going to film the sex scenes, that we were actually going to have sex. Oh, my God. I cannot believe what I'm hearing across the table from me. I cannot believe it. In the next two hours, we'll find out what happened before. She just removes her sweatshirt, and then she just removes a T-shirt, and then all of a sudden, the bra comes out. During... Despite the sexuality of her character, she would not do nudity. And after the show's spectacular run. The two of them struck up a friendship and it blossomed into a romance. For the first time, we'll reveal the identity of the actress originally signed to play Samantha. I got the call saying that, yes, Kim Cattrall had agreed to do it and that I was no longer needed. And we'll go deep inside the Big Apple to find out what it was really like to be one of the Fab Four. We talk about details. We talk about specific situations. Nobody would believe the things that I do. Why in a million years would any grown, sensible woman of my age walk down the street in an outfit like this? This is the story about a group of talented actresses who bonded. There was instantly a chemistry between the four of us that I just sort of felt. Broke up. There's a lot of rumors out there about what happened between these women. And later reunited be able to come back and have that kind of experience again with so many of the same people. It's just it's lightning in a bottle. This is the story of Cynthia, Kristen, Kim, and Sarah. These women created an unbelievable mix. The women of Sex and the City, the E! True Hollywood Story. In May 2008, Sex and the City, the movie, finally hit theaters. I am extremely excited to give it to the ladies who've been waiting and, you know, hope it's the movie that they've been waiting for. Sex delivered plenty of romance. It was like a, 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 a pajama party that was not going to end. And big surprises. People live, people die. Life happens on so many different levels. The film picked up where the groundbreaking TV series left off four years before. Ladies, are we excited? Yes? Good? Are we ready? Are we ready to talk about Sex and the City? Every day in the heart of Manhattan, fans from around the world board a bus to pay tribute to their favorite TV show. I adore Sex and the City. I think it's fantastic. In 1998, Sex and the City introduced viewers to Carrie, Samantha, Charlotte, and Miranda, a quartet of single New Yorkers whose dates, disasters, and one-night stands electrified audiences and altered the media landscape. It changed the way women could talk on television about sex, about themselves, about their desires. Sarah Jessica Parker, Kristen Davis, Kim Cattrall, and Cynthia Nixon played four very different characters. Each actress traveled her own unique path to stardom. Let's talk about the lovely Sarah Jessica Parker who played Carrie Bradshaw. Now she was born in Nelsonville, Ohio and grew up in Cincinnati. Sarah made her entrance in 1965, the fourth of eight kids in her family. Stepdad Paul drove trucks while mom Barbara carried a torch for political causes. Barbara was determined to set an example. No Barbie dolls allowed in our house. My mom said they're unrealistic and unfair to women in America. In Sarah's home, money always seemed in short supply. She would get, if she was lucky, two pair of shoes and two dresses a year. Uh, these were usually picked up at garage sales, flea markets, or thrift shops, and they were always struggling. Despite the crunch, Sarah's parents strove to give their kids an education in the performing arts. They took advantage of every local program and scholarship they could find. 
critics are often recalled about getting up at five o'clock in the morning, doing a half hour of ballet, doing a half hour of an, an instrument, then a half hour of another instrument, then getting in line in the bathroom to get ready for school. At age eight, the budding performer heard about auditions for a local TV production of The Little Match Girl. Sarah beat out 200 other kids for the lead role. I love that I had my own money. It was a really big deal to me. The best thing about it was that I got to miss school. Three years later, Sarah read about a casting call for a play in New York City. The family loaded up their VW bus and headed for the Big Apple. Sarah landed the job, and the family soon relocated to New York. Parker scored a few small acting roles before a major breakthrough. In 1979, the 13-year-old made the leap from background orphan to the title role in the hit Broadway musical, Annie. Despite the high-profile gig, her feet remained firmly on the ground. When you come from such a large family, there's a level of narcissism that it needs to disappear because it's about everybody. It's not just about you or you and your brother and you and your sister. It's about all eight of you. After two years in Annie, Parker transitioned to a more normal life. Sarah's family settled in quiet Englewood, New Jersey. The teenager switched from a school for professional kids in Manhattan to a public high school in the Garden State. I saw this little girl, little skinny little girl. She was cute. Seemed like it was a new experience for her. The novelty soon wore off. I really felt like I would never fit in. I was very awkward and hadn't been around a lot of kids my age because I've been working. Every year we have an art show at Dwight Morrow. They put their handprint up and they come back and they sign it. Right? So she says to me, what do I write? And I said, well, say something clever and unique. So she goes over there and writes down, I'm writing something clever and unique. Sarah was destined for bigger things. In 1982, Parker tried out for a new sitcom called Square Pegs. The producer and casting director were looking for someone to play the part of a geeky high school kid, and they weren't sure Sarah fit the bill. It was very difficult because she really was perfect, but it was hard to see it, and I said, you know, she's too pretty. And so Eve Branstein took her, like, sunglasses that she had, knocked out the lenses of the sunglasses, put them on Sarah and said, now read the piece again. 17-year-old Parker nailed the part, but there was a catch. It meant moving to LA. I think my parents were very worried and it was hard to break up the family the way that it forced us to do because my mom had to be with me. But I really think I really wanted it and ultimately I think I was right. Sarah and her mom found an apartment close to Hollywood, but the actress spent most of her time working long days on the set. Here's sorry. No, not that one. You can't use a ballpoint pen on a cast. Why, is that like not wearing white after Labor Day? <laughs> I think that the whole experience must have been a bit of a, of a whirlwind trip and almost like being taken aboard a spaceship or something because her schedule was so tough and so exhausting. She certainly was not being Paris Hilton at play in Los Angeles. She was working. Low ratings killed Square Pegs after one season. Parker bounced back with a supporting role in the film Footloose. But off camera, she went toe to toe with co-star Chris Penn. They felt very much in love as only two young teenagers can. It was a typical Hollywood romance. It was hot and heavy while they were making the movie, and as soon as the movie ended, it was over. Parker wasn't single for long. On her next feature film, Firstborn, she clicked with actor Robert Downey Jr. The co-stars tried to keep their romance under wraps. They would go in to work on the movie. They would take a cab together, and they were so paranoid about people finding out they were having a relationship that Sarah would get out of the cab about 100 or 200 yards behind and let the cab with Robert Downey Jr. pull up to the set, and she would walk the rest of the way so nobody would think they came in together. And apparently it was the worst kept secret on the set because right away people knew. The not-so-secret hookup lasted for seven rocky years. 
I'd like to tell you that Robert Downey Jr. and I are not married. And if and when we do get married, we'll be more than happy to share it with every viewer that you have. Ultimately, the relationship couldn't survive Downey's growing drug problem. Sarah just did not know how to deal with it. She had, she had come from a, a straight-laced, largely conservative background, even with the liberal leanings in the arts and everything. Uh, she didn't know what to do. Uh, she stuck it out. She tried to help him. She did everything she could. And eventually, she just could not deal with it anymore. In 1991, Sarah moved on to another high-profile romance with America's most eligible bachelor, John F. Kennedy, Jr., they met backstage at a play and immediately started dating. There was just one hitch, the tabloids. It started bothering her. Stuff was being written about her and JFK that was not true, and she got so frustrated on a couple of occasions. She called the paper and said, I wasn't even at that restaurant. Where do you get off writing this kind of stuff? And the relationship ran its course, and they went their separate ways. Parker got back to work. Her comic turn as a Venice Beach bimbo in L.A. Story caught Hollywood's attention. Hey, Mark. Sarah then nabbed a sexy role opposite Nicolas Cage in Honeymoon in Vegas. It's never acknowledged. <laughs> <laughs> I always think Nick is really good. He's always really good. He's always funny and right on the mark. Once again, Sarah embarked on a case of co-star co-mingling. Offset, Parker and Cage shared a short but passionate romance. I generally like Sarah. She's a, she's a terrific person. She's so easy to work with that it, it just made it easier for me to, uh, to, to play these romantic scenes. I didn't have to act as much. Sarah, to this day, is guarded about her relationship with Nicolas Cage. She's been asked about it, and she will only talk about him in positive terms, but will only talk about him kind of vaguely. By 26, Sarah Jessica Parker achieved mainstream movie stardom. But something was missing. My idea of this sort of, you know, uh, Prince Charming is somebody that wants the same for me. You know, they want me to have all those things too, and, and yet treat me in a sort of very old-fashioned feminine way. In November 1991, her luck changed. While attending a play, Sarah chatted with 29-year-old actor Matthew Broderick. The pair hit it off, but the Ferris Bueller star took his time making a move. Approximately three months later, she got a very funny message on her answer machine, basically asking her out. We went out to dinner, and Sarah was a big motor mouth that night, and she was talking a mile a minute. You know, Broderick would occasionally inject something, and, and by the end of that first date, she was totally smitten with him. I felt like it was just me and Matthew in New York City. It was just great. It was, you know, this is a great city for a courtship. It was just fantastic. It was a great time and very unexpected. They're perfect. Matthew is shy and zany, and Sarah's not shy. She's very outgoing, so they have this great balance with each other, and he amuses her so much. The two actors soon set up house together. Parker gushed about the romance on talk shows like David Letterman, and curious fans constantly approached the couple on the street. New Yorkers don't like to admit that they know you or recognize you from work, um, so they pretend to ask you where a club is, and you can see that they're not listening to the answer at all. They're just like, they ask, do you know where Canal Street is? And we'll say, oh yeah, if you walk two blocks south, and we realize they're not listening at all to the answer. Um, they're just kind of looking. While Sarah Jessica Parker found true romance with Matthew Broderick, a future Sex in the City co-star pondered the question, is there life after 40 in Hollywood? Coming up, the reluctant sex queen. She said a few times to me, I can do without walking in and hearing somewhere in the background. And later, between the sheets, even though we're on a show called Sex in the City, does it mean that all of us want to rip our clothes off all the time? Let's talk about the very sexy Kim Cattrall, who plays Samantha Jones. She was born in Liverpool, and her grandmother, do you know grandmother babysat Ringo Starr? How cool is that? 
In 1956, three-month-old Kim and her cool family moved to Canada's Vancouver Island. As a little girl, Kim craved the spotlight. When she was a child, she was never ready to go to bed. If anyone came to visit, she was always anxious to put on a show, singing and dancing. At the age of 10, Kim found the perfect outlet for all that energy when she was cast in a school play promoting hygiene. I played a mighty germ, a cold germ, and I had these little costume with wings on my back and this huge feather, and I tickled all the noses of the kids in this classroom. Kim caught the acting bug. During the next few years, Cottrell signed up for every theater workshop she could find. Then, at age 16, she found a way to take the next step. One of the teachers at one of these uh, summer schools suggested, if I was really serious about it, that I should try to go to New York. And I think in her mind, she thought when I was like 18 or 20, but I just couldn't wait that long. You know, I really felt like I belonged with these kind of gypsies. She had such a blinding talent, a shining talent for that. It seemed impossible to think of another thing that she would do with her life. With her mom's blessing, Kim moved to Manhattan and enrolled in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. It was opening a new world to her, a hustle and bustle of that huge city. She was like a sponge. She just sucked in every experience. She was very shy. She was uh, someone that we would have called a goody two-shoes. The small town teen was shocked by actors who changed costumes next to the stage. We're pretty used to just, as I should say, dropping trow at the, you know, you know because you have, to, you have to make quick changes. I remember that we had one of those to do where Kim looked at us like we were all insane. And, she, and the, during the rehearsal, she said, well, where are we going to change it? We were like right here. And she was very shy. Kim graduated in 1974 and returned to Canada, where she focused on theater work. Soon, a scout for Universal Studios spotted Cottrell and signed her to a seven-year acting contract. Kim moved to Los Angeles and went to work. You were basically a stable of actors that they would put into different shows like Quincy or Starskin Hutch or any of the shows that they had on the Universal lot. Cottrell also made a surprise personal move, marrying a performer she knew from up north. I don't think it was a true love match or anything. As she had been working in the Rocky Horror Show in Toronto and they become very close friends. He wanted to work in the States, and it seemed that she was lonely at the time. The marriage didn't last. The couple split after two years. In 1980, Cottrell auditioned for a big screen adaptation of the hit play, Tribute. The director felt Kim was perfect for the role of a sexy, struggling model. But he needed the approval of Jack Lemmon, the film's Oscar-winning star. I remember when Jack came in, he walked in and I introduced them and he went to, uh, you're her and I'm over there, he went. <laughs> and I knew he knew what I knew. Tribute made few waves at the box office, but another film directed by Bob Clark really boosted Cottrell's career. In 1981, Kim shot Porky's, an outrageous sex comedy about Florida teenagers. Cattrall played a very excitable gym teacher nicknamed Lassie. <laughs> Porky's raked in more than $100 million. When it came out, I was uh, up in Canada doing another play. Just didn't even really know about it. Didn't even do any press for it. It was uh, a sensation. And then I was known as, you know, a, a comedian. She said a few times to me, I can do without walking into uh, the uh, Madison Square Garden hearing somewhere in the background. Oh! Kim's career was on the upswing, and so was her social life. She started dating a successful German architect named Andreas Lyssen. He seemed to be so much in love with her, and she with him. In 1982, the couple married in a lavish wedding ceremony in France. We all liked Andreas. He's a very personable young man. And the fact that uh, he was so well-connected was just so great to know that she would be secure if she ever wanted to give up acting. The newlyweds settled in Frankfurt, Germany. 
Kim commuted across the ocean to make films like Turk 182, Police Academy, and Mannequin. But Catral wasn't happy. There was very little to be satisfied with. I mean, I was, I was basically the girl. I would try to bring as much as I could to each character, but a lot of what I did ended up on the cutting room floor because there just wasn't room for it. Kim's marriage also suffered as long separations took a toll. She wanted someone in her life. She was lonely. She was separated from her family, you know, 3,000 miles away. I could sense that it wasn't going where it needed to go for, for Kim. After seven years together, Kim and Andreas broke up. Gatral returned to Hollywood, but finding good roles wasn't easy. In 1991, she played a Vulcan in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. It was fun. I mean, working on the bridge, I had to play with all those buttons. It was really fun. But Kim's career wasn't exactly moving at warp speed. I think that my life was changing already. I mean, for an actress in Hollywood, you get into your middle 30s, and suddenly your auditions are cut in half. Then, in 1995, director Bob Clark came to the rescue again when he offered Kim a role in his new film, Baby Geniuses. I called her at the last moment, and uh, she was very glad to hear from me and very glad to hear that kind of role, and she said yes before she read the script. The single actress was approaching her 40th birthday. At the suggestion of her publicist, Kim agreed to escort actor Daniel Benzali to a movie premiere. You don't come to a lot of these things. I don't have the time. <laughs> Kim and Daniel started dating. Nine months later, Benzali left a note on Kim's refrigerator asking her to marry him. I gave that no chance. I didn't. <laughs> I just sensed uh, what was going on. I don't want to demean the man. He was a perfectly nice guy, a very fine actor. But in my soul, just didn't think that was the... Uh, the way it would go. No matter what her friends thought, Catral decided to go ahead with the nuptials. While Kim made wedding plans, a future Sex in the City co-star wondered, can a one-time bad girl ever go back to being good? Coming up, Southern Hospitality. She lets loose and <sighs> she slapped me so hard. Kristen's mom and stepdad worked at the local university. They raised their daughter to be a real Southern belle, minus the attitude. I'm very down to earth. I'm very, I grew up in the South. Um, my parents are very down to earth. There were a small group of professional parents, including Kristen's, who felt that it was important for their kids to go to public schools. And Kristen was a wonderful influence on the other students who I felt saw her very much as a leader. Kristen's charisma really came out in the drama department. By the time she entered high school, Davis was a veteran of the local theater scene. We used to call her Little Miss Workshop. Wow, she's actually doing community theater, not just high school theater. Kristen was really working on becoming a legitimate actor. If Kristen was not acting in a show, she was painting set and scenery, and she was assistant directing. Or she was running away from the local paparazzi. We had a few photographers, um, quotes around that word. And we loved to find Kristen often in uh, compromising positions. Uh, if something fell on the floor, she'd bend over and pick it up. I swear to you, somebody would be there behind her with a camera just to, to snap pictures. She was much like the character she plays on Sex in the City. Very proper, very demure, refined. But the young actress wasn't shy about putting on a show. 
Kristen could not wear a brassiere with this particular costume because the straps would show. So in the dressing room, all of a sudden, she just removes her sweatshirt and then she just removes a t-shirt and then all of a sudden the bra comes out, comes off. And I'm standing there and she's still talking to me just like, you know, nothing. She's like, and she's holding the bra in her hand and she's saying, you know, I thought that last night's performance was really very good. What do you think about it? Well, I was like a deer stuck in the proverbial headlights. It was cold that evening in the dressing room. And 17-year-old kid, I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, my gosh, I, this has got to mean something. Christopher decided to make his move during their next onstage love scene. I plant one on her and my tongue leaves the station. And all of a sudden, this look on Kristen's face, she pulls away from me and her eyes get real big and she's looking at me like, what are you doing? And I thought, she likes me. Not exactly. Not exactly. Kristen retaliated during a scene that called for her to slap Cook. The next night, Kristen reaches back and I see that her hand is going further and further back. And I'm just waiting. I know that this thing's gonna be really hard. And she lets loose and... <sighs> She slapped me so hard. To this day, occasionally I can do this little, little thing like this, you know, and I feel like my jaw needs to be reset. Thanks, Kristen. Davis found a different way to make her point at the high school's ultimate event, the Miss Falcon contest. Instead of doing something like twirling a baton or something like that, uh, innocuous, she was actually doing a monologue from one of the plays that we had done, and it was a very serious, dramatic speech, and she won. She became Miss Falcon that year, and I credit a lot of that, not just to her good looks, but her talent. She was just floored. She was just so excited to be honored that way by our high school. Miss Falcon was bigger and better than being the prom queen. In the fall of 1983, the new Miss Falcon flew north to New Jersey to audition for the Rutgers University drama program. I mean, the door opened and in came this absolutely breathtakingly lovely young lady. Uh, she was beautiful and uh, was intelligent and charming. The moment she walked through the door, I said, that's it, she's in. Kristen worked hard to show she was more than just a pretty face. And I needed somebody to play a tom-tom, uh, you know, to beat on a tom-tom. When I asked if anybody would volunteer to do this absolutely thankless job to stand in the wings and play the tom-tom, never even get their nose on stage, she was right there to, v to volunteer. In 1987, Kristen earned her degree and hoped to go straight to the Broadway stage. Well, it's tough starting out in New York uh, to be an actor. She had a lot of trouble, you know, figuring out auditioning and uh, uh, booking jobs. The classic story of the struggling actress. She was, as she said, dirt poor, waiting on tables, doing anything to, to make money, to make ends meet, so she could go audition for this part or that part. Kristen finally caught a break in a low-budget slasher movie called Doom Asylum. We had already cast the uh, one of the leads who was a... Uh, a penthouse pet of the year, and we were looking for somebody who really could bring some touch of class to the role. She really had to pull off some really awful lines and make them sound like she meant them. Don't really believe that old story. How ridiculous. A man who lurks around a deserted asylum and kills people with autopsy tools? Sure. This was a, uh, a buzzsaw kind of thing that we had come up with. Kristen uh, took this very seriously. She knew what she was doing, but she wanted it to really work out well. I can offer you a discount on five-weekly therapy by some excellent Freudians. If you can see her performance, taking into consideration what this is, was pretty good. She had star written all over her here, especially with this buzzsaw going into her head. New York ad agencies agreed. Kristen got cast in a string of TV commercials. Cars, beer, odor eaters. Kristen really earned her paycheck with another ad. The peanut butter one was difficult because I really don't like peanut butter. Don't tell anyone. So I was the mom who had to taste it, you know, like the one mom saying how good it is, and I had to taste it go, mmm. -hmm. So it was tough because, A, there were a lot of kids. 
B, you had to taste the terrible stuff and then go, mmm. Uh, so that was probably the hardest one, that, mmm, it is good. After four years in Manhattan, Kristen wanted to shake up her career. When she got to a certain point, it really was necessary that she go to Los Angeles because she was perfect for film. She was perfect for television. Come on down, come on down. Hollywood, however, was clueless. Baywatch babes like Pamela Anderson ruled, and casting directors gave Davis nothing but bad news. She's not pretty enough. She's not funny enough. She's not tall enough. She's not uh, babylicious enough. She's not... Uh, ambitious enough. Actually, one person was like, she just doesn't seem like she wants it that bad or whatever. I mean, you hear like everything that you can think of would be said, has been said to probably everybody who's successful. Davis managed to get some work on a few soaps before nabbing her breakthrough role in 1994. Parker. Playing bad girl Brooke Armstrong on Melrose Place. Certainly exciting and also a little overwhelming because it's such a big show. I mean, people would come up to me in the grocery store if they heard, like I was talking to a girlfriend and I said, oh, I got a job on Miller's Place and this woman just started talking to me in the grocery store. People are so into it. Kristen became the girl female fans love to hate. Good, go, leave, go on, go on your little double date. How sweet, two pea brains and a couple of sluts. Just leave. I'm used to being left behind my whole life. I'm used to no one caring. You hate me, don't you? I don't even care enough about you to hate you. Now let go. Fine, I'll say it! I hate you! So I got really a lot of irate women. I mean, it's still a compliment, even if they're telling you that you're, you know, very terrible. Davis enjoyed a two-season run before producers killed off her character. Kristen kept working. She guest starred on a classic episode of Seinfeld, where Jerry accidentally drops her toothbrush into the toilet. Success didn't spoil the actress. Kristen, in her truest heart, is really a Southern belle. She's the kind of person that if you invite her to your house for dinner, that she'll home make homemade cookies and bring them with her. And they're phenomenal, too. While the brunette cooked in L.A., a New York blonde pondered do redheads have more fun? Coming up, Cynthia makes history. That was obviously something that garnered her a lot of attention among the press in New York. And later, bad blood. It was as if Kim wasn't even part of that cast at that point. Cynthia debuted in New York City in 1966, the daughter of an ex-actress and a radio reporter. By the time she entered high school, Nixon was already appearing on Broadway and doing movie and TV projects. She even worked with the future Carrie Bradshaw at a recording session for a Laura Ingalls Wilder book. Sarah Jessica and I met when we were 12, 13, something like that. We did a recording of A Little House in the Big Woods, just a record. She played Laura, and I played Mary. In 1981, Cynthia and Sarah J crossed paths again in Tennessee, when they were both cast in the TV movie My Body, My Child. I would say that we became friends because we were shooting for two or three weeks in Nashville, and I was there with my mom, and she was there with her mom, and we would just, you know, we were the same age, and we would hang out. Nixon soon landed a small role in the film Amadeus. The movie shot in the Czech Republic, but Cynthia still managed to get her homework assignments in on time. They came into the school in the mail on the day they would do, week after week after week. This went on for months. To this day, I use that with my kids. You couldn't get your paper in? Do you know what she did <laughs> when she had her homework from Prague? Try to beat that. She was uh, very mature. She knew what she wanted, determined to achieve her goals and uh, she was willing to do the work necessary to achieve them. The actress continued to multitask. While studying drama at Barnard College, she made Broadway history, appearing in two plays at the same time. 
it was an event that really sort of catapulted her into the pantheon of respected stage actresses in Manhattan at a very young age. She would go on stage for Hurley Burley, she would perform in the first act, and she would dodge two blocks away to the Plymouth Theater for the other show. She would stay there through the curtain call, and then she would run back to the Barrymore Theater to perform in the last scene or do the second curtain call. And uh, you know that was obviously something that garnered her a lot of attention among the press in New York. Cynthia also found time to start a relationship with fellow student Danny Moses, a friend since junior high. In the first few months that we were together, we knew that we were going to be together, you know, forever. Cynthia never slowed down. During the next 10 years, Nixon did one project after another, appearing on both the stage and screen. In 1995, all the hard work paid off when Cynthia earned a Tony nomination for her performance in the play Indiscretions. Then, in 1996, Nixon added Mom to her list of credits. Cynthia and Danny welcomed a daughter, Samantha, but the couple decided against walking down the aisle. There's a lot of things that make me wary about marriage, but I also have got to say, I've always felt so confident about Danny and so sure of him that, um, I didn't really feel an, a need to sort of, you know, nail him down. While Cynthia enjoyed motherhood, another woman celebrated the single life. Writer Candace Bushnell chronicled the world of dating for the New York Observer. She wrote a column called Sex in the City, which was really about her life and the world that she knew, which was a Manhattan that not everybody knows. It was sort of a wealthy Manhattan, a Manhattan filled with women who were, you know, went out every night, wore fantastic heels, and dated. The column introduced readers to four fictional and adventurous New York singles, Carrie, Samantha, Charlotte, and Miranda. Carrie was actually my alter ego because there were certain things that I guess I did or didn't do, and I didn't really want to say, hey, it's me, I'm doing that. One of Bushnell's biggest fans was Darren Starr. The former Melrose Place producer came to town to start shooting his new series, Central Park West. Candace Bushnell took him out in the city and took him to Bowery Bar, some of the hottest places in the city, and he thought, this is the New York I want to be filming. He actually thought that that column could be a great series. I felt like I'd never seen a show about sex from a female point of view, and that really fascinated me, the idea of looking at sex from a female perspective, and women are, are, are sexual beings the same way that men are, and I think they're not always given their due. But Bushnell pinned her hopes on the big screen. In 1996, a collection of her columns hit bookstores and climbed straight up the New York bestseller lists. There was movie interest in it from the beginning, but the problem with the movie was that they couldn't quite figure out what to do with the whole, with the whole book, and the whole book has so many different stories. So it just seemed like it really lent itself to a TV series. Bushnell and Starr struck a deal and began pitching Sex in the City to network executives. There was a lot of concern about being able to do the show as they wanted to do it. They wanted it to be an incredibly frank show where these women could talk as women talk to their girlfriends. And they thought network wasn't going to be able to deal with it. They didn't think they could show sex in the way they wanted to show it or talk about sex. They weren't even sure they could call a show Sex in the City. But execs at HBO were ready to roll the dice. They gave Starr the green light. All he needed now were four special actresses. Coming up, the woman who was supposed to play Samantha. I guess they called my agent to say, okay, so it's not gonna work out, but, and we're sorry, we apologize. In March 1997, producer Darren Starr began casting his daring new comedy series, Sex and the City. Top priority, finding the perfect heroine, newspaper columnist Carrie Bradshaw. Sarah Jessica Parker was somebody that I always had in mind for Carrie, a beautiful woman who was empathetic and a fabulous comedian, and I knew that about Sarah. 
he thought she was perfect. And Sarah Jessica Parker was not so sure she was perfect because it had been 10 years since she'd been on television. She started on television. She thought that's what the beginning of her career was, but now she'd moved on. But her husband, Matthew Broderick, and her brother read the script and they said, we think there's something else here. And so then she took another look at it. But while Sarah reconsidered, Star searched for someone else to play Carrie. Rosanna Arquette and Lara Flynn Boyle were approached, but declined. Future Matrix star Carrie Ann Moss and Laurie Singer of Footloose were among those who read for the role before Sarah Jessica Parker finally came around. However, she still had a few concerns. Despite the sexuality of her character, she would not do nudity. And that was one of the conditions that she signed on to early on. To portray Charlotte, the eternally optimistic art dealer, Starr thought of his former Melrose Place vixen, Kristen Davis. Darren knew me, so Charlotte was a much better fit. I mean, Charlotte was somebody that I felt like I understood and I could play for a really long time. But Kristen's audition in Los Angeles turned into an ordeal. The HBO computers were down, and she had to wait hours and hours for her audition. And when she walked in, she wasn't totally clear that she'd done it well. She walked back out. They told her to come back in and do it bigger. She did it bigger. And as she said later, I guess I did it big enough. Next up, workaholic attorney Miranda Hobbs. We sort of saw a number of actresses for the role of Miranda including one comic, Sandra Bernhardt, before turning to Cynthia Nixon. Cynthia is someone I was familiar with um, just from her work on, you know, mostly you know, in theater. Cynthia Nixon read the script and said she would audition for any of the four characters. She thought it was witty, she thought it was smart, she thought it was something that wasn't yet out there. But the producers kept her waiting and waiting. Each time she auditioned, they would say, we love you, but then she wouldn't get a call back. And eventually, after many months, her agent said, Cynthia has other projects, and finally the show asked her to come on. To play sexaholic PR queen Samantha Jones, Starr wanted one actress, Kim Cattrall. She sort of had all the attributes I was looking for. And she was sexy, she was funny, she was a little bawdy. HBO called up Kim's agent, and the answer was very quick in coming. No, she did not want to do a series. She did not want to live in New York. Darren asked me if I would call her up and see if I could convince her to at least come in and have a meeting. And so I phoned Kim, and she said the same thing to me. She did not want to do a series. That was it. I just turned 40, and I thought to myself, I don't know if I want to play a character like this. And also, I didn't really know where the character of Samantha was going to go. There was talk of her having children, and I thought, well, what kind of a show is this going to be? It was a risk for any actress to sort of jump on board and say, yes, I'm going to do this R-rated, edgy comedy about sex. It was definitely pushing the boundaries. There was another hang-up for Kim. According to an interview in New York Magazine, Cattrall claimed fiancé Daniel Benzali didn't want her to do the sexually explicit series. Producers kept searching. They read Denise Crosby of Star Trek The Next Generation and future West Wing star, Allison Janney. Then they auditioned 29-year-old Lou Thornton, a regular on a short-lived Jenny McCarthy sitcom. No punches were pulled regarding the character's sexuality. It was sort of a discussion that was about nudity, but they said, and also you'll be asked to you know, say and do very racy things. And there was nothing in the pilot that offended me. It was nothing I hadn't heard before. I live in Hollywood. Women talk. <laughs> HBO and Star decided to go with Thornton and made the deal. I got the call from my agent saying that I got the part. And I remember she was shocked that I wasn't more excited. I said, OK, great. When do I go to New York? And <laughs> she said, shouldn't you be screaming and jumping around? I said, no, no, that's great. That's great. Because I always, uh, because things happen. And I always wait till the check is cashed kind of thing to celebrate. <laughs> Almost immediately, those close to Star voiced concerns about the choice. I first of all thought she was way too young for the part. She was about five years younger than the other three girls who had been cast, and Samantha really needed to be older. And I also felt that she didn't have the right sexuality. I said to Darren, look, let me give it one more shot with Kim. Darren Star's partner called her up and said, 
listen, I think you're the only one for this part. You are Samantha. You have to do this. And I said, you know, I just feel that this is not right. He said, well, I think you're wrong. I think that this is your part, and it's going to change your life. I got the call saying that, yes, Kim Cattrall had agreed to do it, and that I would was no longer needed. And that was heartbreaking. I was, I was really looking forward to doing it. I guess they called my agent to say, OK, so it's not going to work out. But, and we're sorry. We apologize. So we're offering you a guest star. And I said, great. And they said, but we want the pilot money back. And I said, I already have a plane ticket to the south of France. <laughs> so goodbye. And that was that. Although Kim said yes to Samantha, she said no to Daniel Benzali. The couple called off their wedding and split up. But one of Kim's new co-stars did say her I do's. On May 19, 1997, Sarah Jessica Parker and Matthew Broderick surprised their friends. Approximately 150 people received notification they were to appear at the synagogue for a party. People showed up and they were all ready for a party and everything. And they were announced that you are here for the wedding of Matthew Broderick and Sarah Jessica Parker. And it caught the press totally by surprise. They had their fairy tale wedding and didn't have the press interfering. Two weeks later, the newlywed joined her three fellow actresses to shoot the Sex in the City pilot. There was instantly a chemistry between the four of us that I just sort of felt. There was something about these four women sitting around a table that there was just sort of sparks flying. But no one knew if audiences would feel that same magic. Then, Sarah shot a scene with her elusive boyfriend, Mr. Big, played by Chris Snuff. At the end of the pilot, there's a moment when Carrie gets a ride home with Big. And in the car, Big says to her, I know what your problem is. You've never been in love. And after he lets her out, she comes running back to the limo, knocks on the window, and says, have you, basically. And he says, absolutely. Absolutely. And the camera turns and freezes on her face. And Sarah Jessica Parker said later that that was the moment that she knew that this series had potential. And there was just something about it at the end of the pilot that I started looking for apartments. While searching for a place to live, Kim stopped by a Greenwich Village jazz club. After the set, I walked out and this very attractive man walked up to me and he said, uh, Excuse me, um, my name is Mark Levinson, and I saw you moving to the music, and I was wondering if you were a musician. She said, no, I, I'm not. I, I'm an actress. I said, oh, OK. And I said, are you married or in a relationship? And she looked at me and said, no, I'm not. I said, good, neither am I. And then we went for coffee, and hours passed, and suddenly it was 7 o'clock in the morning. And he asked for my phone number. And the next day, he called me and said, what are you doing for lunch? So we had lunch together and then dinner that night. And we've basically been together ever since. Catral moved in with the audio equipment exec a week later. Sex in the City also moved full speed ahead. That March, production began on the first 12 episodes. We were just in a little cocoon. And we didn't know if people would like it or if it would scare people or if Everyone would hate us, or we just had no idea. But in a way, it was nice because it, we just did what we wanted. The scripts broke all the rules. There was an episode where Charlotte refused to have oral sex with the guy she was dating. The standouts of the black book, John Slattery. For sure, John Slattery. He was the politician in the first two episodes. He wanted me to urinate on him, do you recall? Midway through shooting, they shot the I don't want to be Mrs. Up the episode, which is when Charlotte dates someone who wants to have anal sex. When I was typing that, I thought no one has ever typed this, ever, and no one has ever filmed it. And the first table read, when the girls read it, they turned red and giggled. And I thought, it's either going to really work or it's just going to be like, get out. Our goal is to speak exactly like women do in life. So we talk about details. One storyline went a little too far for Sarah Jessica Parker. Carrie uh, farts in front of Mr. Big. So we loved the idea, and I went down to her uh, room, and I said, listen, Sarah Jessica, we want to do um, Carrie farts in front of Big. And she went, she smiled, and then she said, no, I can't, I can't. 
And I said, it's too late, you smiled. And as soon as I knew that she smiled, I knew it was funny. Sex in the City premiered in June 1998. The reviews were decidedly mixed. One of the reactions to the show from the beginning was, women don't talk like this. And the other was, these are just gay men cast as women. Still, the buzz was unmistakable. Darren Starr said he knew it was making some headway when he was walking and he heard someone talking about the rabbit episode, which is when Charlotte buys a vibrator. And he thought, okay, people are watching this. Kristen Davis worried how her parents would react. There were certain episodes she would be sure and call home and call mom and said, mom, please don't watch this one tonight. Don't watch this one tonight because she didn't want her mother exposed to some of the things on Sex in the City. It was really a risk in the beginning and we just had no idea what the reaction would be and we certainly didn't ever think we'd be a big old hit. Never, never did it cross our minds. We were like, please let us do a second season. Those prayers were answered that fall when HBO greenlit Sex in the City for season number two. No one was more excited than Kim Cattrall. I remember she said, I, this is the most amazing thing. I'm going to get rich, Bob. When I watch Kim's portrayal, I think Kim Cattrall is Samantha. I think she was perfect for the part. 42-year-old Cattrall topped off a great year by marrying Mark Levinson on September 4th, 1998. We've been talking about getting married off and on for a while. And then we thought, this is a good a time as any. Let's just do it. That was quite fast and uh, unexpected, but she seems to have found um, a safe haven, a happy one, I hope. And I hope that this, the third time, will be lucky for her. Coming up, going for it. We decided, Sarah, Jessica, and I, that then, that when they were going to film the sex scenes, that we were actually going to have sex. Sex and the City kicked off its second season in summer 1999. Who wants the wiener? Girl, I'm trying to get rid of one. <laughs> A growing number of fans became addicted to the show's sexually explicit storylines. There was a guy who liked to watch pornography while we were having sex. There was the guy who liked to be spanked. There was the dirty talker. Everybody, the dirty talker was a real favorite. And women kept grabbing me. I'd get out of taxis. I'd be shopping somewhere. I'd be getting on a subway, on a bus, anywhere, going into my apartment building. Women would literally grab me and say, oh my god, that fill-in-the-blank episode that happened to me. The show's writers included a number of women with plenty of dating horror stories. Most of the stuff I write about has happened to me. Sometimes we, we go a little big on some stories, but for the most part, that stuff has happened. You realize, wow, I've dated a lot of freaks. A lot of freaks. I've definitely had men say, oh, is this going to end up in the show, or if I, you know, if we date. And I always say, not until it all goes terribly awry. <laughs> it would be both therapeutic to write, but also therapeutic to sit in a room together and talk about our relationships. Saved us all a lot of money. One particular script really hit men below the belt. It was an episode about a guy who got circumcised very late in life. It was an episode called Old, old Dogs New <laughs> And I happened to have one of the women refer to an uncircumcised penis as a Sharpe. The dog. There's a dog. It's a Sharpay. has many folds of skin. And I got not only letters from the Sharpay Association, who are upset, but letters from the Uncircumcised Male um, Association telling me that I had not been fair to uncircumcised men. The show provided water cooler chat for fans across the country of both sexes. I think a lot of guys watch this show because it's all about trying to find out what goes on, you know, in, in women's heads. And, you know, there's, there's never, you can't never know enough. One of the great things that attracted people to it was the, the, the idea of seeing things that they couldn't see anyplace else. The sexuality. You're sitting in your living room and you're seeing something that's sexual that isn't pornographic, but is making you laugh. Sometimes it should be shocking and then sometimes it shouldn't be. Sometimes it should be funny. So uh, we try to do it all. So, what are we drinking? Flirtini, vodka, pineapple, champagne. Just to be Oh, honey, I'm way past a flirtini. I need a f***ing tini. Hey! 
and nobody did it as much or in as many positions as Sex and the City's resident party girl, Samantha Jones. What I have to do on this show, I can't even explain. You just have to see it. <laughs> because if I broke it down, nobody would believe the things that I do. She had sent me videos of it. I was sort of scared, you know, because I knew it was a sexy thing. And I was a bit shocked with the first one. But then I gradually became an addict. And it is so funny. There are very few women who can look that good naked and be funny. So she's figured it out. The crew even created a special prop for the actors who played Sam's boy toys. The men would wear something they called a KC cup for her initials, which was a little cup that was flesh colored that they would wear so that you could see their backsides but not realize they weren't fully naked. And that made everybody a little bit more comfortable when they were in bed. We decided, Sarah, Jessica, and I, that when they were going to film the sex scenes, that we were actually going to have sex. And uh, we'd have clear the set and then just the director and us because when you're having sex, you want as much. Of course not. What do you mean, real? It's all fake, like my acting. I must say I'm not nearly as brave and courageous as some other women on the show. In fact, it's somewhat of a joke among the crew that any sex scenes with me, I will inevitably be wrapped up like a mummy in a white sheet. Sarah Jessica Parker wasn't the only one who refused to bear it all. And even though we're on a show called Sex and the City, does it mean that all of us want to rip our clothes off all the time? In this city, men were the sex objects. You got to walk around in a bathrobe a lot. You see the other guys walking around in the bathrobes. The girls are all fully dressed, and they're like doing their thing, and the guys are naked. And then you say, you see the other guys, you see John Corbett, and you see, you see Chris Norton, you say, you having sex today? Yeah, I'm having sex today. You know? So you walk around, and you got to look good in the bathrobe. We were going through men on our show the way Babe Watch goes to women. We were just like, get in, get out. You're done. Get out. And they're sort of like eye candy for us, and they just come on for a day or a week or whatever. We just have our way with them, and then they leave, and then we get new more, <laughs> more boys, and, you know, it's, uh, it's fun. You know, if you're looking for monogamy, you're just going to have to move to New Jersey. As the series seduced more and more viewers, the cast worked overtime. We work 20 hour days often. So when you work 20 hour day that goes into the night and into the next morning, it kind of messes up your, your sleep cycle. The effort paid off. In August 2000, Sex in the City made the cover of Time magazine. It was official. This was no ordinary series. This was a cultural phenomenon. Here was a moment where women who were sexual, gorgeous, didn't have men, and were becoming really icons, really think someone who women look to, and also something that single women in their 20s and 30s and 40s started to say, this represents my life. Cast and crew felt the pressure not to rest on their laurels. It's lovely that more people know about the show, and it's, and it's thrilling that people watch it and have responded well to it. It's also terrifying because we're no longer sort of under the radar. We are now a part of the television community, and it's a challenge, and it's a challenge to be better than we've ever been. We gotta figure out a way to stay cutting edge. Coming up, clothes, clothes, and more clothes. I don't feel like a fashion icon. Do you feel like a fashion icon? Every moment of my life. <laughs> As Sex in the City grew into a phenomenon, star Sarah Jessica Parker took on another role. The evolution of her becoming an executive producer is not the norm. It's not like, oh, you're the star of the show, so of course you're the executive producer. It really has to do with her unique perspective and skills. And I think that's really great because her opinions, her judgment is dead on, you know, whether it's a, a character point or a script point or a fashion point or whatever it is. I really believe it does all revolve with, uh, with all those wonderful ladies who are each in their own way brilliant, you know, but sh there has to be the linchpin and she's it. The longtime New Yorker protested when scripts called for more and more of her scenes to be shot inside a Queen's soundstage. 
she was bothered and she really spoke to both the producers and HBO and said, this is not a, a TV show that takes place on a soundstage. This is a TV show that takes place in the streets of New York and in the restaurants in New York. We really need to get back out there on the streets. I think New York is completely integral to the story and it's as important a character in the show as any, any of the women on the show because this is a unique group of women in a very unique city and this city made these women. The women also made the city. They turned several Manhattan eateries into trendy hotspots. Case in point, Sushi Samba. It was when Samantha meets Richard and throws a martini in his face. It changed people's perception on the restaurant. But they're just excited to eat at the same restaurant where sex in the city will stay. I mean, of course, it's great for our business. The show made an even bigger impact on the world of fashion. Keeping our eyes to the right, we're going to be passing the woman that is the brainchild behind all those funky things that you saw Carrie and the girls wearing, Patricia Field. Have you heard of Pat Field? She won an Emmy for her trend-setting fashions on Sex in the City. Back here is a rack of some of Sarah Jessica's clothing, or Carrie's clothing, I should say. And I hear very often people telling me, you know, Sex in the City has, like, changed the way the uptown woman dresses. Why in the million years would any grow and sense of a woman of my age, I walk down the street in an outfit like this, but, you know, I'm paid to, I have to, <laughs> and I'm thrilled to. Fashion became, in some ways, the sixth character of the show. I mean, it became one of the reasons why women watched it. Uh, no, I don't feel like a fashion icon. Do you feel like a fashion icon? Every moment of my life, <laughs> from the time I get up in the morning till I go to bed. People who maybe weren't so in the know about fashion suddenly became just fashionistas <laughs> overnight almost. Whatever Carrie wore, viewers wanted. The Carrie necklace has surprisingly been very nostalgic for people, and people have enjoyed going out and getting their ne necklaces again. Bags, shoes, flowers, necklaces. Flowers especially really, I think, are shocking. Carrie wore flowers in season three, and they took off, you know, urban outfitters, I think, in bowls by the cash register. And don't forget the shoes. One of the biggest symbols of the show and something that ended up becoming a, a huge impact of the show was the rise of the $500 and up Manolo Blahnik shoe. It became Carrie's signature shoe, and it's entirely because of this show, which showed these women running around in these insane stiletto heels that are incredibly expensive. Every morning on my way to work, you know, I see women standing beside the Manolo Blahnik sign having their photograph taken. So it's been unbelievable for our company. I can get in a taxi, say, let's go to 31 West 54th, meaning I don't say Manolo Bonig, I just say the address, and the taxi driver from Pakistan will say, oh my God, Carrie Bradshaw, Carrie Bradshaw, Carrie Bradshaw. Even Carrie's favorite cocktail became the poison of choice for singles in every major city. Let me tell you something. Those cosmopolitans, if we've done anything for America, we've made parties funner because people drink those like they're, you know, Kool-Aid, and then they are smashed. While the cast was flying high, the press scrounged for dirt. Paparazzi were ever-present. They were, they were always around. There were a lot of tabloid stories about fights and this and that and the other thing that were based on nothing other than trying to stir things up. People just make up stuff to go for it, you know? It's like, if you say it enough, then Maybe it'll be true, it'll be great that, uh, you know, they have some scandal. And uh, our show has been um, shockingly scandal-less. I've been on sets where there's, you know, been stuff going on, but not on this set. I mean, the most important thing on any given day on our set is the work ahead of us. I think that the four women got along just splendidly. They had a, a really nice working relationship. They got along at, in, you know, on set, off set. There, there wasn't really any of that. But in September 2001, sex took a back seat to harsh reality. September 11th happened actually after the fourth season had been shot, it was pretty eerie because the final episode of the fourth season was called I Heart New York, like those old t-shirts. 
It was a very strange day. We were actually in communication with each other. Kristen was on a plane that was not allowed to take off, and we were talking on the phone, and it was we were trying to get her out of the airport and stuff. Uh, myself, my boyfriend was downtown. That was scary. Uh, my daughter was in school, and I couldn't figure out whether to take her out or not. New York is a changed place, and we are in and of New York. Um, so I hope we will in some way honor the people of New York. What we're trying to do is capture the spirit of New York, the spirit of the people that live here. Uh, not to belittle any event that happened. We can't even touch it, so we're not about to. What we're going to try to do is depict the girls the way people who still live in New York today live in New York, which is they go about their lives, they think about it, but they move forward. A few visual elements were changed. Producers took out shots of the Twin Towers from the opening credits. There was a very beautiful scene shot between Kim Cattrall and James Remar when they're dancing on a roof and they've just taken a morning a swim. And that scene was framed to show the World Trade Center towers and it was gorgeous. But after September 11th, those Twin Towers were digitally removed because people felt it would be too hard to see them that early on. Because anytime anybody, any of us saw the Twin Towers, it became so emotional. The four women forged ahead. In February 2002, Harvard University gave Sarah Jessica Parker their Hasty Pudding Woman of the Year Award. I feel like there's nothing else I have to do in life now. This is it. This is the pinnacle. This is, this is, this is one of the great things. This is what I will tell my phantom children. <laughs> Mama got the Harvard Hasty Pudding Award. <laughs> A few weeks later, kids were no longer a phantom concept. Sarah found out she was pregnant. She is beaming. She is thrilled. Yes, yes, it's all going very well. My first thought was, good, because I know how much she wanted a family. And the second thought I had was, how can we find a four-foot flower? It meant a quick scramble to reorganize the season. It meant consolidating the season to eight episodes instead of, let's say, 12 or 16 episodes. The crew found creative ways to hide Sarah's growing belly. I can think of occasions like with the, the refrigerator door being open and, and her standing and looking at another character, you know, and it, it hid the belly. Sarah wasn't alone on the baby watch. Cynthia Nixon announced a few months later that she was expecting her second child. The thing that's amazing about both Cynthia and Sarah is that you would never really know that they're pregnant other than, you know, the beginning of a belly. I mean, they're up at 6 o'clock in the morning, they're doing the 16-hour days, and uh, they're just, you know, they're, they're going through it. Filming wrapped up in July 2002. Three months later, Sarah gave birth to a son, James Wilkie Broderick. Everybody always said to me when Sarah got pregnant, you know, oh, was she asking you for advice because you're a mother already? And I, I would say, like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, we confer about stuff, but, you know, she's one of eight. You know, I'm an only child. When I became a mother, it was like, wow, a baby, huh? Well, let's see, you know, Sarah's just has been around babies all her life, and she just knows how they work. Two months later, Nixon and longtime boyfriend Danny Moses welcomed their son. Charles Ezekiel Moses. But with new beginnings came a major ending. In January 2003, HBO announced that season six of Sex and the City would be its last. The producers and the actors always thought that this show wouldn't go beyond six seasons. And what Sarah Jessica Parker and Michael Patrick King both would say was, you leave a party when it's at its height, and you walk out in everyone's good graces, and you go when you're at your most popular. We want people to be sad to see us go rather than to feel like at last they're out of our living rooms. It's the idea of our last season. We haven't even filmed right. our last right. season yet. I hope you're still sad. I'm going through finished. withdrawals already. Oh, good, good. That's a very Just flattering. Just think you have 20 whopping episodes. As the series prepared to wrap, Kim Cattrall pulled the curtain down on another part of her life, the actress's five-year marriage to Mark Levinson. Only a year earlier, the two co-wrote a sex education book titled Satisfaction, 
the art of the female orgasm. A lot of guys, I think, want to be great lovers. They just don't know how, and they don't know how to please a woman. I mean, my husband Mark and I, our dream would be a couple getting into bed with the book and making it their own, taking this as a launching pad for their own experiences, their own scenarios. In May 2003, Kim filed for an uncontested divorce from Mark. Coming up, sex on the big screen. Her spokesperson, she said, uh, basically she would have been game to do the movie, but was uh, waiting for a script. In March 2003, the women of Sex in the City began shooting the sixth and final season of the show. New mom Sarah Jessica Parker was pumped. The very first episode back after the pregnancy was the one where we had her running to Wall Street. And she was in shape and running, and I wanted people to see that I knew she'd come back. I wrote that episode, you know, months before that, and I knew she'd show up and be Carrie and ready to go. Even with baby James in tow, Parker had no problem multitasking. He shows up and he's there and Sarah Jessica's doing her job and somehow ma managing to do everything she has to do. Behind the, you know, pay no attention to behind the clothes. Something's going on over there and it, she's making it all work. Cynthia Nixon's son, Charles, joined Sex in the City daycare as well. I mean, it's really fun having the babies there. People are so nice to them. Um, it kind of gives a lift to the day. But I think it's also hard. I know I find it hard, you know, having my baby there that I, that I miss and that I want to be paying attention to and I'm trying to focus on work. Even tougher for the actresses, knowing the series was winding down. We're kind of aware that we're coming towards the end. So it's um, wonderful, but also, you know, kind of a little emotional and we're just trying to hold ourselves together. The last season was incredibly emotional for the actors. They'd become so close at that point, both among themselves as actors, but even the writers and the crew. I mean, this was a show that actually kept pretty much the same crew for all six years, which is pretty unusual in a television program. The writers put the four characters through plenty of changes. Samantha got breast cancer. Miranda reunited with her old boyfriend, Steve. Charlotte tried to adopt a baby and Carrie fell for a Russian artist played by Mikhail Baryshnikov. Fans wanted to know if her ex, Big, would re-enter the picture, but everyone's lips were sealed. Did you hear about what's gonna happen this year? Tell them. We get in the hot tub to <laughs> And that's all I'm gonna tell you. It was an incredibly guarded secret. Parker, Baryshnikov, and Noth flew to Paris to shoot scenes for the big finale. It was crazy. The, the French seemed to love Sex in the City. The paparazzi was everywhere. That's, that's the best way that I can really recall things. The paparazzi, the crowds, it was just such a, a fast-paced, exciting time over there. No one was more surprised than Sarah Jessica Parker. She felt like it was a bit crazy. She seemed to be, I think, somewhat overwhelmed with the response that we received. Despite the commotion, the cast managed to shoot three different endings. Which one would air was anybody's guess. None of us knew. We kind of were just waiting ourselves because we, we weren't handed scripts for that, that last episode. In January 2004, the last scenes were filmed in New York as the women faced the end of an era. There were a lot of tears. Um, the women's apartments, which were these beautifully constructed, actual, real apartments, but on a soundstage in Queens, for example, Carrie's, you know, had a real hardwood floor. As they took those down, those moments were incredibly emotional when they realized their apartments no longer existed, which had been their residences for all intents and purposes for six years. That was a moment that they all had trouble with. Then another sad moment. Carrie, Samantha, Charlotte, and Miranda leaving their favorite hangout for the very last time. 
There were hundreds of people watching, and the four girls walked up the street together, and that was the end of the shot. And afterwards, everyone was applauding and crying and rushing over. And it was kind of like, well, that's that's a really proper goodbye, almost. Yet, you know, these characters are going to continue to have their lives and and carry on and be in New York City and, and be friends. HBO scheduled the last episode of Sex in the City to air February 22nd, 2004. The finale turned from fond farewell into a media event. It was really a measure of how in incredibly integrated this show had become in American culture, that by the end of season six, the women were brought on Oprah to talk about the end of the show and how sad they were and how sad America was to be losing them. Sarah Jessica Parker was on the cover of Vogue. She was on the cover of W. Every interview with each of the women was about how were they dealing with the end of this series. HBO's largest audience ever, a record-breaking 10.6 million viewers, tuned in to watch Carrie dump her Russian lover and reconcile with Big. But the episode only left fans wanting more. There were tons of rumors that the show was going to be continued into a film. Um, and at the end of the show, when they did a farewell tribute just before the final episode aired, there were even hints dropped by Sarah Jessica Parker, like, if we will go now, leaving in everybody's good graces, perhaps we leave the door open to revisit. And everybody sort of read that as a movie is coming. I'm thinking of a story. We're trying to make sure that this story would be something that the fans would like to go to the movies to see. And uh, we're moving forward, and there's still a couple of pieces that need to be you know, aligned to make it all happen. In April 2004, an excited Kristen Davis appeared on The Ellen DeGeneres Show and talked about the movie. Plans were made to begin shooting that summer. But when the project stalled, the media reported rumors that Kim Cattrall demanded script approval and a paycheck equal to Sarah Jessica Parker. I want to do it. I know my storyline. I love my storyline. Um, I'm available. I'll drop whatever else I'm doing. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going on, and some of it in the paper seems mean, and my feeling is that that's just really strange and unprofessional, and I don't want to contribute to any of that. The July 23rd edition of USA Today printed Cattrall's reaction to the stories. Forget script approval, I wanted a script. As for money, Cattrall was quoted as saying, I wanted all of us to have a piece of something. It would be a shame to come back and not reward the actors who had so much to do with shaping the show. In May, Kim Cattrall issued a statement announcing she was passing on the Sex and the City film to do another project. Through her spokesperson, she said uh, basically she would have been game to do the movie, but was uh, waiting for a script, waiting for script approval. It never came, never saw any pages, and she had to move on, accept other work. With Kim committed elsewhere, HBO pulled the plug on the film. According to media reports, her co-stars were unhappy with Cattrall's decision. There's a lot of rumors out there about what happened between these women at the HBO party after the Emmys. The uh, women were all in attendance, but Kim breezed in and out. She was at her own table. And Sarah and Cynthia and Kristen were laughing, sitting at each other's laps and drinking each other's champagne. And they were at a table for hours. Um, it was as if Kim wasn't even part of that cast at that point. Coming up. It was something Cynthia was very happy to sort of keep low key. She wasn't closeted, she didn't try to hide it. After wrapping production in 2004, Sex and the City enjoyed a surge in popularity. A toned-down version of the show went into syndication, attracting a whole new audience. I don't feel like I'm not a part of Sex and the City anymore. It doesn't really go away, do you know what I mean? And it just feels like, like we're still, still at it, you know? I want one, two, three, sex. You ready, girls? One, two, three, sex. 
In Manhattan, the Sex and the City Hotspots tour could barely keep up. We're going to be going into O'Neill Speakeasy now, which was used as the scout on the show. And it's a bar with scout. See, Steve. Right now, we're carrying over 800 women and just a few guys each week. We've had people from every single country, the Philippines, Hungary, Australia, the UK, Italy, Germany, and much, much more. Businesses like the upscale Muse Hotel jumped on the bandwagon, offering a Sex in the City getaway package. Tourists loved it. They come in, we greet them by name, we find out exactly what time they'd like to have an in-room massage, it's for an hour. As for the girls, they kept busy. Kristen Davis signed on as a spokesperson for L'Oreal. I love makeup. Then, in 2006, she starred with Tim Allen in the Disney feature, The Shaggy Dog. Hey, don't let Shaggy have people food. And with Sarah Jessica Parker's hubby, Matthew Broderick, in Deck the Halls. I think her potential is limitless. I mean, sometimes it's difficult when people do a series like that because they get so identified with it. But I think she's good enough and sharp enough and astute enough. She's going to keep on going. Kristen's most important role came in 2011. Like her Sex and the City character, Charlotte, Davis adopted a baby girl, Gemma Rose. She found a way to balance parenting and career. I only bring her for doing two shows just because I'm separated from her for most of the day. But... You know, she's got her busy schedule. She's got play dates in the park and whatnot. New York is a great place to have kids, so she's really doing well. Kim Cattrall also experienced motherhood on screen. Refusing to be typecast, in 2005, Kim played a mom and skating coach in the film Ice Princess. Most of the scripts that I've been getting have really been very reminiscent of a character on Sex and the City that I played for over seven years, which I take as a compliment, but I would like to play other characters as well. In 2005, Cattrall produced and hosted a documentary about the history of sex and took to the London stage as a quadriplegic in Whose Life Is It Anyway? Turning 50 in 2006 didn't slow her down. For me, you know, there's been real high points and kind of disappointing low points, but I continue to want to dedicate my life to being an actor. Cynthia Nixon never stopped being the consummate actress, but post-Sex in the City, it was her personal life that made headlines. In 2003, she broke up with longtime boyfriend Danny Moses. The single mom then became an advocate for the New York City school system. And I think it, it very clearly speaks that most of what's uh, not working about our public schools can be solved with, uh, with government funding. Through her work promoting education, Cynthia found romance. She met a union organizer named Christine Marinoni, and the two of them struck up a friendship, and it bloomed, it blossomed into a romance. This was fine, and it was something Cynthia was very happy to sort of keep low-key. She wasn't closeted, she didn't try to hide it. All of her friends knew. This was nothing I thought I couldn't survive. I mean, it was a little crazy, you know, being on the front page of the paper, but it wasn't so bad. Career-wise, Cynthia was also happy to stay close to home. The type of project most likely to get Cynthia Nixon's attention right now is anything that will keep her in New York City so she can be close to her two kids. In 2006, Nixon won a Tony Award for Best Actress for her performance as a grieving mom in the Broadway play Rabbit Hole. At the same time, Cynthia was battling for her life. In 2008, the actress revealed that she fought breast cancer two years before by having a lumpectomy and radiation treatment. Nixon became an advocate for breast cancer prevention. The number one advice that I would give any woman uh, is just to be sure you get your mammograms. Make sure you get them every year. Cynthia had happier news to share in 2009. She became engaged to girlfriend Christine Marinoni. In 2011, the pair welcomed the birth of their son, Max. A year later, Cynthia and Christine got married. As for Sarah Jessica Parker, the actress returned to the big screen with a vengeance in The Family Stone and in Failure to Launch with Matthew McConaughey. She's got a good mix of sophistication and yet able to blush, you know what I mean? Um, she was fun to work with. She's a pro, man. It was, it was fun. In March 2005, Sarah Jessica Parker celebrated her 40th with a huge party at New York's legendary Plaza Hotel. Kristen and Cynthia attended. Kim did not. She was in London doing her play. 
the relationship between the women was the focus of much conjecture. They have all gone off in different directions, but I think there's a connection that will always exist between them. Finally, after years of speculation, July 2007 brought news that fans of the series were aching to hear. Sex in the City was coming to the big screen. What's more, all principal cast members signed on. I'm extremely excited and you know, it's very rare that a person has this opportunity once and then to be able to come back and have that kind of experience again with so many of the same people, it's just, you know, it's lightning in a bottle. That fall, filming began in New York. Production crews tried to keep a lid on the shoot, but the open-air sets ignited a paparazzi free-for-all. Sex and the City, the movie, premiered in May 2008. Fans blew down the doors. I mean, it's New York, it's heightened the fashion, you know, the hairdos, the makeup, it's, it's all a delight for the eye. And it feeds your imagination, and it feeds your guilty pleasures. And I think that that's what the fans love. When the curtains closed, sex grossed $412 million worldwide. By 2009, director Michael Patrick King promised a sequel. There is simply nothing to tell yet. I mean, there really is. I mean, he really is just starting to flesh out a story. In June 2009, Sarah and her husband Matthew welcomed the birth of their twin daughters, Marion and Tabitha, with the help of a surrogate. In May 2010, the women of Sex and the City returned to the screen in their second movie. Sex and the City 2 was amazing. Number one, the clothes are breathtaking. The love triangle between Carrie, Big, and Aiden. <gasps> Couldn't have written it better. Meanwhile, the TV series that launched the phenomenon found a new home. In 2011, E! began rebroadcasting Sex and the City. We keep thinking people will get sick of us, but so far they haven't, <laughs> which is really nice. These women created an unbelievable mix which forever will be a part of television history. It allowed women to be single, it allowed them to be sexy in their 30s, and it allowed them to want as much as they were entitled to. I just think about what it's done and, and how it's changed my life and so many people's life who love the show. I mean, what it's done for women. I'm just so thrilled to be part of it. There was nothing like it before we came along, and strangely enough, there's still nothing like it. I feel very lucky. We're thrilled the way people have responded to Sex and the City, and it's been a great ride. It's been really nice.